Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Mikey Amhenna. Uh, thanks so much for joining. Today, we have a wonderful community presentation um, entitled Orientalism and Opera, given by Hamar, who is currently in Cairo, but originally delivered this presentation um, in New York probably like three years ago. One year ago? Wow. That feels like three years ago. But then again, <laughs> then again. I don't know what that uh, says about the presentation, Mikey, to be honest. No, it says, it says more about 2020 than anything else. Okay. Um, Ahmad, I'm going to unshare and then let you go ahead. So, um, you know, the, the introduction is I basically grew up like playing the piano and studying music history, but I never critically thought about the fact that we basically see Arabs portrayed particularly in opera all the time. And so I wanted to open this presentation with a motivating example, which was from a performance at the Metropolitan Opera in New York, which is where I live from 2013, a uh, performance of Rigoletto, one of the most famous uh, Italian operas by Verdi. So I'm gonna go ahead and play the clip. <laughs> So hopefully you guys heard that uh, and the video, uh, the video is working. So essentially my goal is that by the end, of course, this should go without saying, but uh, this opera was written in uh, the early 19th century. There was no uh, Saudi Sheikh in the original opera. Uh, but hopefully by the end of this presentation, we'll understand enough about the history, the context of this discipline and some information that can help us understand on a theoretical level and also on various other levels how we should understand uh, the emergence of something like this in 2013. Uh, so the, the motivating question of this presentation is what actually motivates this kind of musical orientalism and hopefully that can serve as a launching point to eventually understand how have maybe on a broader level orientalist depictions in music contributed to the developing and understanding of Western culture. Um, and then maybe even from there, Arab culture as a, as a dialogue to that, as an interlocutor to that, um, but kind of using this as a launch point and then sort of bringing it to the conversations that we often have in Africa around like, okay, like what is Arab culture? So this talk is going to focus on the presence of Orientalism and depictions of the Arab world in Western classical music focusing on opera. Here are a few examples of topics that will not be covered in this presentation. So I will not be talking about Arabic music, so Arabic maqams or anything from the Eastern tradition uh, of music. Uh, you know, things like Fairuz's use of the electric guitar, which is like something I talk a lot about my friends, uh, talk about with my friends where, you know, we're talking about the mixing of Western and Eastern music or the influence that one had on the other. We're, we are getting into that, but f strictly through uh, the operatic lens or Beirut's burgeoning indie scene, which is also something that um, obviously we all uh, know and love and, and talk about. So the outline for this presentation is in three parts. First one is uh, very quickly, hopefully it's, I'm, it's been uh, sort of re reviewed many times in, in Havikra, but uh, maybe just a very quick review of you know, what is Orientalism. Uh, and then secondly, uh, with that basis going into how did Western classical music composers engage in Orientalism. 
in various ways. And then third, you know, what does Orientalism say about the arc of music history and classical music as a genre? And then how does it affect our ability to understand and express Arab culture more generally? So to start with the uh, Orientalism 101, I, I don't want to dwell too much on this section since I, I know many people are familiar. But, uh, you know, my paraphrasing of Orientalism is that, you know, it refers to the depictions, attitudes, technologies, and frameworks that were used by Western scholars to represent what they conceived of as the East or the Orient with the purpose of engendering cultural superiority and political domination. So this is like my summary of the seminal work of Edward Said, who of course coined the term Orientalism in his 1979 book. Um, more particularly and sort of importantly, uh, Said identifies the Napoleonic invasion of Egypt in 1798 as the launching point of the Orientalist project. And specifically, Napoleon enlisted at least 100 architects, mathematicians, scientists, and indeed artists to accompany the, exp uh, the expedition in order to document, study, and produce knowledge on Egyptian culture. The culminating work of the project was Jean-Baptiste Fourier's enormous Description de l'Egypte, which was comprised of 24 volumes with thousands and thousands of pages. And this was the first major document that was the uh, sort of the archive, the study, the production of knowledge around Egyptian culture. Here are a couple of images from the description. Probably many of you are familiar with this work, but it contained here on the maps, on the right you see it contained maps. Uh, you have, um, you know, obviously diagrams and schemas of the various artifacts that were found. And then on the left, uh, you know, highly uh, visual renderings of the, uh, the, um, the temples and the sites and monuments that they found when they went. We're going to get into this in more detail. Of course, why was this work significant? Well, I sort of argue that there's like three major ideas here to why this work is very significant. One of them is that it espoused the notion that the Orient needs to be restored to its classical greatness due to its prior contact with European thinkers of antiquity, specifically like Pythagoras and Caesar. So this is actually very interesting because in the description itself, you actually have them like writing about all the things that they spoke, that they found in Egypt, and then they're like linking it back to like Pythagoras and Caesar. So essentially appropriating and incorporating what they found on their imperial expedition and making it kind of as that like appendage to Europe, which brings me to the second point. The second point is that this, this work uh, essentially formulated the Orient as a place with imperial importance and as a natural appendage to Europe. And then third, it made every observable detail into a generalization and every generalization into a law about Oriental nature. And this was uh, specifically in its you know, documentation of the practices, the customs, uh, the spiritual traditions that they encountered during the expedition. There are many, 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 many well-documented examples of Orientalism in the arts. And probably Delacroix is, you know, one of the most famous examples. This is one of his most famous paintings, the 1834 painting of women of Algiers in their apartment. Um, here, of course, you have the, uh, the ladies sort of lounging with their... Uh, you know, shisha pipe, and then you have the, um, the uh, black servant uh, looking over her shoulder. And many of these works held a couple of very important uh, traits in common in their portrayal of Arabs or the Oriental culture. Specifically, they portrayed this culture as being defunct or static, uh, sensual and sexualized, which is obviously what you're seeing in this painting, backwards and strange, and then indeed our favorite word, which is exotic. Um, naturally something we may have all experienced as that lasted until the present day. Um, you know, the system of knowledge specifically that, uh, or knowledge production that followed the publication of this work was an important imperial tool because it actually strengthened the ability of Europeans to dominate and rule all aspects of the societies that they colonized. So from their land and resources to their social and political mobility. The pursuit of knowledge in the West for this purpose actually has a direct legacy to this day, characterized as, by Sa uh, Saeed as uh, like the lingering effects, which he um, 
which he brings to light in culture and imperialism. And here I kind of have an article from last fall where, you know, the education department uh, officially said that, you know, Middle Eastern studies programs have to advance the security interests of the United States in order to receive further funding. So, you know, nowadays we see even more uh, explicit examples of the ways in which uh, the pursuit of knowledge and this like knowledge production is like feeding into the, the physical um, uh, imperial like strategy, right? So um, from here, you know, of course, Said focused on literature, visual art, politics in his writing, but there are actually many other expressive forms that employed Orientalism like music. Um, and this is kind of like the basis for why I thought this would be really cool to, to kind of talk about. So that brings us into the second section, which is uh, musical Orientalism. I wanted to start with uh, a really famous like opera that hopefully many of you know. So in 1782, uh, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart composed the opera Abduction in the Seraglio, which took place, uh, which takes place in an Ottoman harem. And the plot of the opera focuses on a, a very heroic Spaniard named Belmonte, who rescues his beloved Constanza from the harem of Pasha Salim, who is an Ottoman royal. And so, of course, I wanted to play a clip from Amadeus, which is the most famous Mozart movie, which many of you may have seen. And uh, of course, this is one of the very, very famous scenes, but uh, I think it demonstrates one of the points that I want to make uh, pretty, pretty nicely. Oh, let's see here. Now, down to business. Young man, we're going to commission an opera from you. What do you say? Majesty. Uh, did we vote in the end for German or Italian? Well, actually, sire, if you remember, we did finally incline to Italian. Uh, did we? I don't think it was really decided, Your Majesty. Oh, German. German, please, let it be German. Why so? Because I've already found the most wonderful libretto. Oh, <laughs> have I seen it? I, uh... I don't think you have, Herr Director. Not yet. I mean, it's quite new. I'll show it to you immediately, of course. I think you'd better. <laughs> well, uh, tell us about it. Tell us the story. <laughs> well, it's quite amusing, Majesty. It, it, it's set. The, the, the whole thing is set in 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 uh, in in. Uh, Yes. Where? In a harem, Majesty. In a seraglio. Uh -huh. You mean in Turkey? <laughs> yes, exactly. Then why especially does it have to be in German? Well, it doesn't especially. It could be in Turkish if you really want. <laughs> now, my dear fellow, the language is not finally the point. Do you really think that subject is quite appropriate for a national theater? Why not? It's charming. I mean, I, I won't actually show concubines exposing their, their... <laughs> it's not indecent. It's highly moral, Majesty. It's, it's, it's full of proper German virtues. Excuse me, Majesty, but... So you get the idea. No. So this is like really bringing it all together because the, ha the harem here is considered as inappropriate for the national theater, but Mozart actually seems to believe that it is perfectly charming and full of good German virtues. So why is this? Uh, some ideas, one could be that this is basically very consistent with Said's idea that Western values and cultures are actually constructed in, at least in part by these Orientalist depictions. So, for example, German culture is heroic because Turkish culture is despotic, right? So that kind of idea. Or there is kind of something like entertaining maybe in make, making a mockery of the culturally backwards harem and its culture, which is also consistent with the Orientalist tradition that we, that we talked about. So in actually like dissecting the opera itself, I kind of propose this schema or this formula for doing so. So the, the schema contains three parts, musical style, music, narrative, and production. I'm gonna define these three. So within one opera, music would ref the music category would refer to things like musical style, instrumentation, melody, and harmony, everything that, that plays into what you hear, 
Narrative is the, the part of the opera or the section of the opera where you have the story and the plot, the setting, the depictive intentions, the values and morals. So like what the story is about, right? Everything we just spoke about with the, uh, the harem idea. And then of course, production, which I think is something that is often not spoken about much, uh, which is of course the visual rendering of the, of the narrative. And then also very, very critically and importantly, how and where the opera will be performed. So my question now is, can we use this schema to identify uh, basically the function of the Orientalist elements in Mozart's opera? And so here's the part of Amadeus where they actually uh, perform uh, the premiere of Abduction in the Seraglio. Or this is the ending. So, um, so let's now like apply this clip of the, I mean, I had to show one actual thing of opera. So this is, this is like now the part where we're like going to put the theory or the framework on the, on the musical work. So, um, so the production is probably the easiest part to kind of dissect. So obviously the set design is, uh, like full of this, like Oriental depictions. You have like these like weird pink towers, like, you know, I, I guess they're just trying to, to make some kind of visual rendering of what they understand about the Ottoman harem. The music, interestingly, is a harder one to dissect, and we'll get a little bit more into it in a second. But, you know, in fact, Emperor Joseph II apparently told the composer something along the lines of, it was too beautiful for our ears, my dear Mozart, and an awful lot of notes. I think that in the movie, they say it's like too many notes. That's one of the very famous scenes where he's like, too many notes, too many notes. Um, and then, you know, that kind of brings us to this question of like, are there actually examples in opera of composers that attempt to link the Western art form of opera with the Orient on a musical level? Um, because it's interesting to think about potentially this feedback being like, well, maybe Mozart was trying to depict the Orient in some way. And then the way that it was registered by his critics was that it was just an awful lot of notes. There is an interesting conclusion to this. So I think the perfect case study for this is actually opera and Egypt, um, which is why I'm like very excited to be uh, giving this presentation while, uh, while here in Cairo. So very famously in 1871, um, the Khedive of Egypt, um, Ismail Pasha commissioned uh, Giuseppe Verdi, perhaps the most uh, sort of prolific opera composer that we, we all know today, to write an opera to celebrate the opening of the Khedivial Opera House in Cairo. Um, his opera, which was Aida, also a very, very famous opera, um, didn't actually make it for the opening due to the Franco-Prussian War and Rigoletto was performed instead, which is uh, the clip we saw at the beginning. Aida did eventually premiere at the Cairo Opera House at the end of 1871. So to kind of review here, Aida is set during the Old Kingdom of Ancient Egypt, which is the 26th through the 21st century BCE. Um, which used to be before common era, but I heard it's now being used for before COVID era. But yeah, before common era and is about a love affair between Radames, who is an Egypt Egyptian warrior, and Aida, who is an Ethiopian princess capture captured as a slave. At the Metropolitan Opera in New York, Aida has been performed over 1,000 times uh, since its New York City premiere in 1886. So the TLDR of the story 
if you really want to watch the opera for yourself, you just like close your ears and eyes for the next 10 seconds. But it's set during a time of war between Egypt and Ethiopia. Aida, who is an Ethiopian slave, struggles between her love for Radames and her allegiance to her country. Eventually, she decides to betray her lover by convincing him to reveal secrets. And then he pays the price when his superiors discover his betrayal. And she decides at the very end, of course, a Verdi opera has to end extremely tragically. She buries herself alive with him. And we're all crying at the end. Very dramatic. So now let's get into like Haida and Orientalism. So in fact, there is evidence that Verdi communicated with François-Joseph Fétis, who is the first known European to study non-European music as a part of general music history. In general, in fact, he characterized Oriental music using Western vocabulary. So he would say, you know, there in the Orient, they flatten the hypertonic and he would use a lot of language like this. And secondly, he actually estimated the sounds of native instruments with Western ones. And so this is part of what produces maybe now the mixture of sounds and cultures that we hear today in music. But um, he was one of the first ones to do that. And there's actually evidence that Verdi spoke with him before Aida was written. And interestingly, now when we go to critique, you know, it's like, how do critics like Said actually describe Haida? Musically speaking, it, it was described uh, as being, for example, overdeveloped, hybrid, radically impure, a new chromaticism. And so without maybe boring you with the details of getting really deep into musical analysis, um, there is this maybe idea that Verdi was actually able to transmit Orientalist ideology musically. And this is like a very provocative claim, but uh, I don't think it's too, it's too far-fetched given what we know about the depictive intentions of the work, the way it was produced, um, and of course the stories that were, that were being portrayed. And so this is kind of like my area of uh, kind of interest, you know? So that's, uh, that's maybe handling the music side. Of course, production, remember we have the production, the narrative and the music. So now we're in the production pillar. So of course, uh, you know, the costumes and the set were designed by a very famous Orientalist Egyptologist, Auguste Mariette. And Verdi himself never visited Egypt before he wrote this opera. And so that brings us to the question of, uh, you know, from where did Mariette himself, who was the costume and set designer, draw inspiration for the set of Aida? Maybe if we like take a random guess, right from the description. So in fact, that brings us way back to the beginning where we were when we were talking about that huge volume that was the first production of knowledge, knowledge of Arab culture um, and practices and customs, etc. And then that was lit, the literal reference for a hundred and some odd years later uh, for the set of, uh, of Aida. So that brings us back uh, full circle. Uh, in terms of narrative, painstaking research was done in creating Aida, physically and conceptually. For example, priests were transformed into priestesses. There were various kind of changes like that. And according to Said, following conventional European practice of making Oriental women central to any exotic practice, and this is maybe something that rings a little bit more familiar given the more contemporary forms of Orientalism that we're, that we're more used to. Now, why is this important? Um, you, know, uh, you know, Egypt was technically within the, uh, the Ottoman Empire, um, but, you know, uh, it was gradually established as a dependent and subsidiary part of Europe. And also, Ida was this idea of, like, putting Egypt before Europe, staging its antiquity and its cultural importance. And so how did they do this? They basically took those empty and lifeless sites, which we saw in those, uh, in those images, and they ascribed them into a staged actuality. So this is the way that they kind of transformed what they captured and absorbed. And then this was the process of appropriating it into European culture through the art form of opera. Of course, you know, why is this important? Aida had both an aesthetic and an informative effect on Europeans. Um, and this is, uh, this is sort of true today, maybe even just starting from the fact that it's been performed at the Metropolitan Opera over 1000 times since the 1880s. So now uh, we're kind of transitioning into the last section, but um, I really want to stage this question of Aida through the ages. Um, and this is maybe the part people will be most interested in talking about at the end. But, um, you know, I'm very interested in this question of saying, okay, Aida in 1871, 
was all about embodying the authority of Europe's version of Egypt at a moment, at a particular moment in its 19th century history. But like, what about more recent Aidas? What about like 2013 Aidas or 2019 Aidas? Um, and so in order to make that comparison and see how an opera transform, transforms through the ages, I wanna use the example of Leontine Price, who is, um, bringing us to the U.S. in the 1950s and the pioneers specifically of Black participation in classical opera saw Ida for the first time in a racial lens. So now we're really, this is like a tangent, but this is like a launching point into something else that kind of is demonstrating my point. In particular, what was very famously said when she was invited to play Ida, I believe as the for, for her first um, premiere as um, a black soprano in a lead role at the Metropolitan Opera. Um, it was said that Leontine is to be a great artist. When she makes her debut at the Met, she must do it as a lady, not a slave. And um, this was said by, I believe, the musical director of the Metropolitan Opera at that, at that time. Um, it's in the subtitles, but I, I also understand that this is a content, contested quote. Um, so yeah, I suppose regardless of whether it's authentic or not, the idea um, I think is still very relevant to think about because of course this motivates this question of like, is Ida a black role? Is it an African role? Is it an Arab role? Like, and more importantly, what does it actually mean for a white actress to play Ida in 1871 versus in 1976? Here, of course, on the left, you have the most, maybe the most famous um, living soprano, Anna Netrebko, who is practically getting ready to step on stage as Ida in blackface. Um, and, so, uh, and so this really kind of motivates this question of like, who is supposed to be singing? Who is the opera for? And uh, essentially what message is it, is it conveying? And that is only possible uh, in a contemporary, in, in the contemporary time period or in the recent time period, as opposed to in the 1880s. Um, and I'm gonna kind of like summarize that uh, more in, a, in, in the next slide. Um, of course, and you know, most importantly, does the emergence of singers like Price um, actually undermine the opera's imperial origins or does it serve to reinforce them? It's a very provocative question. Um, and so essentially, I just wanna like stage that in this, uh, in this um, sort of slide with the three versions, right? So on the left, you have the costume design from the description, which shows Haida's Orientalism as an expression of imperial motive. And then you have Haida, um, Haida's Orientalism as an expression of racial inferiority. And then you finish with uh, Haida's Orientalism as an expression of cultural appropriation. So this is kind of the arc of, of Haida's, um, of Haida's Orientalism specifically. Which brings us to looking forward. So we're really gonna like wrap up here. Um, so I guess I wanna kind of enter entertain this question of like, how can we understand and potentially counteract Orientalism in opera going forward? Um, Orientalism in classical music today is uh, of course alive and well as we, we've, we're talking about it right now. Um, you know, we have to just like acknowledge that these portrayals persist even if their context and their application shift, right? So we have a lot of um, excellent literature, scholarly literature on this, starting with Edward Said here are a couple of his books covering Islam is a great one. Um, you know, I also wanted to briefly plug a very important example, which is very often overlooked uh, in a more contemporary example of opera and empire. Um, Theodore Herzl actually includes opera in his utopian vision for the colonization of Palestine by European Jews in Alt Neuland when he, there's actually a very famous quote in which it said, you know, will there be theaters in Palestine, queried Mrs. Lashner. If not, I shall not go there. Right. So, um, you know, this link between opera and empire is uh, it really persists. And um, and, uh, you know, there's a way to uh, to identify it, not just in lit not just in scholarly literature, but um, in, in many other ways as well. And then, of course, that brings us to kind of like the 2019 example. Right. So like, you know, in 2019, Orientalism manifests um, as a projection of Arab culture as understood in the co context of contemporary politics, right? Like you see that the, the reason why they would dress 
uh, a sinister character in Rigoletto as a Saudi sheikh, of course, or as a Gulf uh, sheikh, is a reflection uh, of that projection of Arab culture as understood through the context of that contemporary political orientation, right? So this is like, this is what bringing us back to the first example. And this really cements the performing arts, I think, as a dynamic practice um, and one which is always about the, just as much about the now, at least as much as it is about the then, right? Um, and this is kind of my response or my take on people that, that think that opera is, should only be about sticking to the past, sticking to our roots, and just trying to honor the work as it was, um, you know, back in the day. And I don't necessarily think that's phys physically, certainly it's not possible, but, you know, also conceptually or figuratively, I don't think it's, it's really possible either. Secondly, other than acknowledging that these portrayals exist, we should maybe find ways to subvert and question the status quo, either within or outside the operatic form. I don't know how, um, and, you know, it's, the question is, you know, do we do it from outside of opera by maybe reviving pre-colonial forms? Here I have a, um, a screenshot from, uh, from a, a wonderful cultural center here in Cairo, but they're all about, you know, reviving old music forms. And, you know, this question of like, does revivalism on the one hand counter the dominant narratives established by Western art forms, or does it actually just constitute like an empty nostalgia that simply highlights our own failure, in fact, to deal with modernism? And this is like maybe a scholarly debate, you know, that, that is taking place. And this tension of course exists across creative disciplines in music, certainly in architecture, absolutely, um, and in others as well. Or do you try to do it within musical forms, right? So, you know, within music, can we subvert the status quo? And, you know, potentially what that could look like is, you know, former colonial subjects as, you know, composers, singers, set designers, and indeed patrons of opera houses. You know, uh, here is a, uh, an image of uh, a Canadian Lebanese Armenian soprano, Isabel Bayraktarian, who I saw uh, playing um, the lead role of Blanche de la Force um, with my mom back in 2011. And, um, and so, you know, it does, does her presence on the operatic stage mean that it's a colonial subject reclaiming her subjectivity within the Western uh, art form? Something like that. I mean, throwing it out there as uh, maybe the frame we, we could use to understand that potentially. Or do we take a structural approach, right, similar to that of Western knowledge production, so education and training in these art forms. And so here I have, you know, just like we have the Paris uh, Conservatoire for music, uh, you know, now we have institutions here in the Middle East, such as the Edward Said National Conservatory of Music, which has a Western uh, music um, uh, uh, section and you know do we take it from within the structural um, the, the, the structure itself as well or do we just like reappropriate elements of the western canon like instruments um, and so here we have Im Kalsum and behind her she has cellos and violins we've all seen these instruments used uh, and so yeah do we reappropriate those uh, those instruments into our uh, into our culture and that maybe gets us into that Fairuz guitar uh, example but um, you know, these are just a couple of ideas that I have around, around like next steps, right? And so, you know, in conclusion, uh, of course, Orientalism is an important aspect of our history as Arabs and the way that we understand culture, you know, the, uh, ours and others. And it follows that Western classical music through its institutions, its design and its Orientalist strategy is part of our history too. Um, my kind of like concluding question is, you know, will creating an environment for, or, or will creating an environment where Arab culture can thrive require a more active effort to counter these representations on the operatic stage? I'm not sure. Or could we maybe even pose my favorite question of all, uh, which was also the question I ended my last topic presentation with, which is, is there even, right, an authentic version or definition of Arab culture to which we must subscribe and aspire to? Or is there no true Arab culture and only a system of such representations? So this is like my, my goodbye question to you all. Thank you for listening. Here's my contact information.
Um, hope you enjoyed and uh, excited to hear any questions, great. comments, hot takes. Thank you, Amma. That, that was great. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, let's start out with uh, uh, Julia. Julia, the first question, then I have one. Please, everybody, type your questions in the chat as we, uh, we still have 10 minutes of Amar's time. Amar, thank you so much. I think Mikey put me first because he could see me like boiling with like questions and reaction. And there's so much that I actually had to like take a Word document and structure the way I was going to ask this question because otherwise it's going to be unbearable for the rest of the people on the line. So thank you so much. Um, I love the way you finish your presentation with like different paths and different options on how we can go through this. Um, I'm deeply passionate about Mozart, about classical music, about opera, about ballet, and also about the scientific course in Egypt. And to be honest with you, I'm not sure um, how I could judge myself the intention of Mozart at the time or of the scientific that I think really were uh, all of them what the scientific of Mozart are very committed in their work. And I think we could also kind of uh, talk about the Turkish march, which is a, an extraordinary piece of music, also um, influenced by um, the war against the Ottoman Empire. Um, so there's no doubt that obviously those pieces were born, they reflect the reality of a kind of Western centric European 18th century, 19th century um, uh, situation. And so they are extremely filled with racial stereotypes, which were at, at actually at the time acceptable. And today they can seem problematic and offensive. But I think for me, what's important is like, how do we, how do we build from this today? Like, and I was, you know, I, I want to check with you, like, but, because I believe there is sometimes an issue in main, in big institutions, like the Met, like really big opera house. But today there is kind of a range of alternative options with smaller opera house, with smaller like dance group that are trying to fight the mainstream ideas and try and offer other things. Um, I think you can also talk, uh, we could also talk about like the blackface and this issue coming back in ballet as well, because it's very predominant like in ballet, like the Corsair and how, you know, we, it's all super orientalist with the snake and the camels and the belly dance. Um, but again, there are amazing like ballet companies that try and change the narrative around it. And so it's maybe more about also promoting those ones and giving visibility to those ones so that those ones can at one point, you know, come on stage at the Met or the Rare Opera House or whatever, whatever it takes. But to me, really, and I don't even know whether that's a question, but to me about Aida specifically, that whether it's opera or ballet, they show us work that are meant to be universal because they touch, they should be basically able to stand on their own, whether we talk about an Arab woman, an Ethiopian, Egyptian, like no matter, we talk about sacrifice, we talk about love, about impossibility, we really talk about topics that could be said anywhere at, at any point. And so I think it's really the responsibility of the creative people to make sure that those themes can resonate no matter where you come from and no matter what's your age, no matter what's your gender. So that's kind of the last message that I want to finish on that for me, it's really about how do we not condemn Aida for being, you know, an Arab woman and, and just an Arab woman, but how do we see her as a female, um, a female character and hero through the history of, 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 of opera and of the rest. Um, yeah. So if you have any examples of good productions where, um, it's not too orientalist, and yet we keep um, the essence of the opera. I think I would really appreciate that. So I think that was my question, but it was a very long intervention. So so sorry, and thank you so much for your time today and for your research. I appreciate your intervention. If, would anyone else like to respond, actually, to Julia? If anyone has a response, type it in the chat, and then we'll call on you next. Okay. Um, but, uh, okay, so I have a very basic question, Ahmad, and then I'm going to keep on going. Um, basic question is, uh, uh, it seems as though what you talked about today was mostly the sort of Orientalism that would be featured in the libretto or in sort of the staging and the symbolism. Is there, are there resources that maybe I could sort of dig into that would speak to the Orientalism on the, in the score, right, from a musicological perspective? Yeah, uh, you, you mentioned from the top that you're not going to talk about Malkamath, you're not going to talk about that stuff, but um, does the music itself, if I'm just reading the notes? Yes, yeah, so that's kind of like what I was starting to hint at because yeah. 
people did like people did hear something different right yeah. in the music um in the music of Aida and in the music of um of the seraglio right and that came into the critique now of course it's not possible i don't believe that they would have made contact with the with the actual musical traditions of the colonized people because you know it's not the present day where we're throwing around recordings and you know we're in a globalized perspective where we have access right think about it at that time verdi didn't even visit egypt before he wrote aida yeah. uh, not to mention that at that time orientalist scholarship in general not just within music was so limited strictly in the sense that of course they were sort of like dignifying all of the knowledge that was collected during that colonial application um, occupation with this like title of just contributing to modern learning where the natives of course had neither been consulted nor treated as anything except for pretexts to like that text which was not even useful for the natives right so so of course that musical contact would have been much more difficult to uh, to incorporate but my argument is that I think they did like anyways um, and they you know it, it just might we might not hear it but I do think it was like there, I guess is like what I would say. Great, thanks so much. Okay, so we have four questions left and technically four minutes. I think we can try to get through most of them and go a little bit over because um, I want to get to them. So Yara, Nada, Zena, then Ahmed. I'll yeah. just read her, her comment. She said, um, I don't exactly understand the point of questioning around, the, uh, uh, the questioning around racial angle of Aida's portrayal by a black soprano. I would imagine that if a female were to portray Aida, we would say, quote, opera so white. Aida was Ethiopian. Let me know what you think. Yeah, this is a really, really important point. So I think, and this also gets into Nata's question. So I'm looking here. Maybe we can like discuss this all, all at once. So, um, so I think it's more of the first role she could get as a slave role. But I guess it comes to the idea or question, like, should Arabs uh, or Black? Um, oh, right. So the idea of like writing new roles. Great. So this is like, this is really like a fertile area. The, the point of this is that in 1871, uh, or yeah, in 1871, when this opera is performed, not only is it physically impossible for um, like a black person to sing Aida or to sing on the operatic stage period. And by physically impossible, I mean, just by virtue of having the training and having studied in Europe and being able to stand on the stage, but it was also not figuratively possible. It was not, it was not conceptually possible to have any kind of person on that stage except for the, uh, the uh, sort of uh, reigns of, of European power who were, uh, who were obviously not black, right? And it's actually through the process of sort of history through through like the arc of history in which it becomes physically possible right for for people of various backgrounds to engage and learn and train as operatic singers and now we're stuck figuring out like the result of that and like what does it mean and in fact for the first time ever we're even able to ask ourselves the question of the first time that a black soprano sings a lead role at the metropolitan opera slave uh, stage should be she be playing a slave and you know, my, I, I guess by posing this question, what I'm saying is it, it comes back to my point about opera being a dynamic practice and that there is never such thing as just holding a piece statically or uh, like in, in history. And, and it's totally fine that we're able to sort of address these issues because I do think that it creates more opportunity for, uh, um, for an open and just world not just in in music but in general and that kind of comes to nada's point about like writing black uh roles which is absolutely something that we see uh being asked in film being asked in other disciplines actually even outside the arts you know um a, a black actress can't win an oscar unless there is a role uh for her right so this kind of this kind of stuff i think is really pertinent in opera and you know, I, I personally enjoy uh, new music. Like there are all these like stalwarts of classical music that are like, no, I don't listen to anything after 1930, blah, blah, blah. Like, no, on the, on the contrary, like I do think there's a future in which we can answer these questions and be convinced of our answers to these questions. Great, um, thanks so much. So I see uh, Zena, Ahmed, and then Laith. Uh, Zena, 
Um, I guess mine was more a comment than a question, but it was going back to your conclusion on how we would be able to, I guess, reclaim our narrative or present ourselves in theater and in art. Mm -hmm. And I think, obviously, I have zero background in um, opera and definitely um, Arab opera, if any. But I, as a people, I think we still suffer from the Khawaja complex that anything foreign is better. And so in order for us to even reclaim our narrative, um, do you think that we would have to get rid of that? And, and whatever narrative that may be, right? If it's past or present or non-existent as you um, posed before. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think that gets into another area potentially. Um, because that manifests obviously like in lots of different ways. I, I think like within the arts, um, it's it's hard to say because of course, uh, it, I think it gets back to like kind of what I was saying earlier about like, I mean, should we be obsessing about our past or should we be acknowledging our current reality and figuring out how to move forward? And so, you know, in, in asking ourselves the question of like, okay, should there be a music conservatory in, uh, in Ramallah, right? Like, or not? Or should we just be like taking pride in our own culture? Um, I suppose, I don't know the answer to that, but I do think that like, um, whether we like it or not, um, art forms are continuing and evolving and changing as time goes on. And so, you know, whether or not we decide to build our own institutions to participate in it or not, like the art forms are there. And so I, uh, I suppose I don't really know how to answer your question. I, would someone else like to, to jump in? Uh, for the sake of time, I'll, I'll let uh, people sort of type it into the chat. Um, we still have two final things, uh, Ahmed and then Leith. Hi, Amar. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for the presentation. I'm a theater nerd myself, so this is just like speaking my language right here. Um, so, so Ida was, uh, so it was done as a stage musical in 2000 with music by Elton John, which is very interesting just to see that sort of mediation and remediation of the work. And that musical has a lot of influences from um, gospel, Motown, pop music. And I mean, it never really got the amount of Orientalist flack that Ida the stage opera does because I mean, it's the year 2000, the music is a little bit removed from it. Um, and so I guess I'm changing my question from what I wrote in terms of thinking about how Opera is a very exclusive kind of art form. You need a lot of training. It's, you know, it's expensive to attend the opera. Not everyone can go to the opera. It's, there's a whole lot of social etiquette surrounding the opera. So I'm wondering, and maybe this is a question for you, like, is opera a viable musical medium to have these sort of authentic representations? Or is it sort of, you know, are we giving opera a responsibility that it can't quite handle given how musically and musically difficult it is to pull off an opera? And, you know, something like a stage musical that's more accessible, sort of what's, you know, what's the potential there is my question, I guess. I like love this question and because I think about this a lot. Um, and I think the, the way I like, settled myself into how I feel about it is by thinking about the progression of like other art and musical forms. So I, just as you mentioned musical theater, like I think about, let's say, uh, visual art. Like we have seen many, many reappropriations of older paintings, depictions, portrayals. We see the way that we see like pop art versions of Delacroix that were rendered by former colonial subjects. And they are actually trying to usurp those representations very much from within the discipline. Another example being literature, of course, the, the novel, 
uh, the, you know, the novel form is not something that really uh, is part of our pre-colonial, uh, you know, tradition, uh, literary tradition as Arabs. It emerges, you know, in the 19th, let's say 19th, late 19th or early 20th century. And now very much it's, it's widespread enough for us to say that oh, Taha Hussein is, uh, you know, speaking to the soul of Egypt, right? But through the novel form, which is not even our form historically. So I think it's possible. Have we gotten there yet? Potentially not. And my maybe more provocative claim is that the fact that opera is sort of this, uh, like, as you said, like inaccessible, seen as like this high class thing where it's like dress up, blah, blah, blah. Of course, that's not something that is intrinsic to opera itself. That's something, that's a commentary on social attitudes around opera and society's understanding of opera, right? Right. And so those, there's nothing intrinsic to the form itself. And the evidence of that is here in Cairo, we have the, you know, Dar al-Opera, and I've been there before where you see, excuse my language, but like tons of crazy shit, like, you know, like that you would never expect to see at uh, the Metropolitan Opera in New York. So I'm like all for that. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm always, I'm always down basically. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Okay, great. Laith, uh, how about you take us home and then we can follow up. For those of you who, ha who are still on, if you haven't uh, given us feedback, please, I'm going to repaste the link in the chat because, um, I want to take as much time for the question. Okay, Leith, take it away. Thank you, Mikey, and thank you, Omar. That was, that was really fascinating and thought-provoking. Uh, I loved it. So I don't disagree with any of the premises. I mean, I think there is Orientalism, but my question is really sort of about the intent. So, I mean, I think the fact of the matter, Europeans were very fascinated with Arab culture, right? I mean, whether they show it correctly or incorrectly, they love it. And if they didn't love it, they wouldn't, I think, portray us anywhere in any form. So I kind of, you know, give them credit for that. However, there is a lot of stereotypes, but I also w wonder if these stereotypes are different from Arabs' own stereotypes of themselves. Like if Arabs were to do a scene in an opera, wouldn't they do the buildings the same way? Wouldn't they focus on belly dancing and the harems and all that stuff? I mean, you know, all the 1001 nights things. And again, I don't have a yes or no, but it's a thought process. I mean, a thought provoking thing. And finally, how does it also how does the Orientalism, you know, we talked about today differ from, let's say, how Americans portray British people in movies? And it's not just Oprah. Or how Europeans and Arabs portray Uncle Sam or Americans. So, and there is always, you know, there are stereotypes. And even like men and women portrayal. I mean, there's all, all these kinds of things in art. So I guess I'm just trying to, you know, make a wider net to explain these kind of human or artistic simplifications of other cultures. And remove... I mean, there, is, there might be some negative, you know, of course, intentionality, but not necessarily so, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And again, thank you so much. I love the presentation. And if you have time to play uh, piano, that'd be great. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you for, for your comment as well. And I think I definitely do want this presentation to serve as like a launching point to get into all of these other areas. I don't know about like Americans' comments on like other Europeans and stuff. Like that. That's like getting stuff that I literally have no idea about. But... I think probably the logical next step for people to look into from this presentation is the opposite, which is the ways in which Western music were incorporated into Arabic music. And this is something that I think some people have spoken about already. I'm seeing in here um, a comment from Fatma. Of course, Abdel Wahab was very influenced by classical music. He was a genius at bringing Western and Middle Eastern scales together. Absolutely true. Fairuz, uh, you hear piano, you hear various kinds of instruments in there. Uh, many people don't know that uh, Li Beirut, which is one of her most famous, famous songs ever, uh, is based on uh, a classical piece uh, by Aran Huez, which is the Adagio, and that's the, that's the piece. And then she, uh, she used that, that melody and that song to speak to, uh, you know, the soul of a nation, etc. So... Uh, yeah, I think that this is a good launching point to get into lots of other areas, and I'm glad that you... Um, that you enjoyed it. Um, okay, everybody, stay safe, stay strong, stay curious, enjoy. Bye, everybody. Amar, thanks so much. This was fantastic. Mm -hmm.